All right, I've got this lesson here, which I've sat on for a while, titled, God Must Speak. It is not enough for modern man anymore to accept that God spoke to a few guys wearing sandals and goat skin 4,000 years ago. Today, I tell you, God must speak. Let me read here from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verse 3 to 4. It says, And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see God, to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. It seems so easy for God to just appear to people. Never mind that while they teach us God appeared to these people to deliver them, there were other people who were thinking about God and keeping purity laws before Israel in the book of Exodus got in trouble but God apparently didn't appear to them to deliver them notice as well that the first family on earth as I went into the etymology and the Hebrew words and looked into the scripture many videos ago and showed you that contrary to Amos chapter 3 verse 2 that says Israel is the first family the only family rather that the Most High knows that the original family was the family of Adam. And he dealt with Adam first. So Amos is not speaking straight in line with the Torah when he says Israel is the only family. The family of Adam and all his descendants, that was the first family that God knew. But he shows up to the first family, the family of Adam, who was living in their land, their territory. And he doesn't show up there to, in this spectacular way when they got in trouble. He showed up to kick them out and to pronounce judgment. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 37. And because he loved thy fathers, therefore he chose their seed after them, and brought thee out in his sight, and with his mighty power out of Egypt. Can you imagine that? I just mentioned the first family was a family of Adam, so Israel came later, so, you know, it's a little bit strange for Amos to have been talking like that, but he chose their seed after them because he loved their fathers. Where would the fathers have gotten a seed from if they didn't get it out of the house or family of Adam? So Adam was that first family. Adam was that first family. So the seed of Adam is what you should more think of and not the seed of Israel. Because if they have the seed of Adam, then they are born of Adam. And if everyone who descendants who descend out of the so-called house of Israel would then be an Israelite, then everybody who descends out of the house of Adam would then be an Adamite. They are the children of Adam. So if you say that people like Abraham and Noah and so on were black and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob were black, and you're linking them somehow through the genealogies in the Torah back to Adam saying that they came out of Adam, then these are the children of Adam. They are of the house of Adam, the family that was first created. They are the seed of Adam. And that seed of Adam was overthrown and a new house set up, the house of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6 to 8. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, the Lord thy God hath 
chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So apparently more special than the children of Adam who got the original DNA and first place DNA on the earth. So only deal with the first son or the firstborn, that's Adam, not Israel that came later on. So Adam is the firstborn on earth, firstborn of the creator, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. It's funny here too, he says, that shows the to be a special people unto himself. And I told you that the, the family of Adam was taken down. Obviously, they were fought out of the garden. They were kicked out. And you see that it's not a shush for me to say fought because this supposed angel came with a weapon of war, a sword, a flaming sword. So there was war to take down this kingdom of Adam. The first man, the first kingdom the first great ancient kingdom. But the special property right there would be to Adam, the family of Adam, because he has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. So after everything else that he created, he thought Adam was special and he came and visited with Adam. The Lord God, verse 7, did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, had the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of the Pharaoh king of Egypt. So this people, Israel, is being treated as being a special people. They're set apart in some kind of way, which is a little bit odd now that I'm looking at it and looking at some certain things in history. And uh, and now that I've, I guess I could say, officially begun my study in ancient Egypt, which, you know, I never wanted to do, but I'm being forced to by things that I'm studying. And it's my study of the Torah from the New Testament is fake series that actually led me into this. The Torah led me into studying out that the New Testament is fake. And then in my search to learn more about how the New Testament was made, the Torah ended up leading me to search on Africa. And I never cared about Africa all the days of my childhood. Now I find that in dealing with the search for Africa, because of the Torah, the Torah further springboards me into a search for Egypt, which is basically Africa too, right? So the Torah actually brings me back to things African, to things Egyptian. And it looks more interesting to me than the Torah. Because if you say the Torah came out of Africa, came out of Egypt, because if you say that the Israelites are from their land is Israel and you say Israel is a part of Africa except on political maps Israel is a part of Africa that means the Israelite is an African of ancient times which then means they would be black the way we think of black today although for other reasons people say don't don't use the word black, but we understand just generally speaking that Israelites would be black and they're African. And they came out of an Egyptian territory at the time when we see the Torah really developing. And if you've got the Torah, as many have shown in the walls of the monuments and tombs and so on in Egypt and in the teachings and um, of Egypt and in the Egyptian priesthood, then the Torah then is Egyptian. So that means then the African created the Torah. Some are going to disagree and say no. That's the level I'm at right now. And I'm free to change it later on and say no. This was not even created in Africa. 
You see, because I'm, I'm finally free in my mind to go where I want to go, to think what I want to, see, to, to think, excuse me. And so at my young level with things African and Egyptian, I'm just, I'm not coming into it now thinking like this is like Christianity or Hebrew Israelite stuff where I can just, I just got to say one thing and stick to it till the day I die. As I uncover more information, I'm free to switch and change because we're uncovering the past like the lesson I just recorded. Not posted up at the time of this recording being made about time as shadow then we're just trying to uncover the past time is like a shadow you can't quite tie it down because it itself is not the image that is producing the shadow so when you learn one thing you gotta go back and you learn something else and you should accept that you might need to change something so i'm, I'm happy about learning and growing and changing so then, how can Africans get revelation if God did not reveal himself to them as revelation has to be given when you come from the point of view of the Torah? Because you're not just going to have this stuff. In the Torah, God has to speak to you, give you that revelation. Same with the New Testament. you got to get a revelation from the Holy Spirit. So if the African, if the Israelite is an African, then they got a revelation from God. So that then means that the African got a revelation from God. God appeared to Africa. God appeared to the Egyptians. And you tell me that the same Torah says, do not do as the Egyptians. Is that a statement of conflict and confusion? You are the Egyptian and God appears to you. And then the word comes out says, do not be as yourself. Exodus chapter 19, verse 11, 18 and 20. And be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people. Well, no, that's verse 12. Let's, let me run to verse 18 and 20. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in a fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of the furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. Verse 20, And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount. So this is like some kind of a mountain god or a sky god. This is the same way that the God of Israel is presenting himself. And I, I, I fail to understand from the other lessons I've been teaching how this God tells you to be unique, to be set apart. Don't do as the Egyptians. Yet he appears to his people in the same way that nations had been known to describe the actions and movements and revelations of their God prior to him appearing to Israel on Mount Sinai. Why didn't he come in a different kind of way than the sky God of the different nations? This is very odd. Because it's all a big trick. So come down upon the top of Sinai on the top of the mount and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount and Moses went up. So as far as I've found out, this mountain was in Egyptian land, like they have Egyptian territory all over that part of the earth. So then this is basically an African happening. This is a revelation to Egyptians. So then the God of Israel descended upon the mountain in Africa to an African group of people so should he then be known as the God of Israel or the God of Africa the God of Egypt or the God of Cush since God as far as I've found so far is a Cushite slash Egyptian concept 
Apparently, though, based on the scripture, he seems to have appeared to people. And he spoke and gave his Torah back then. Today, I say that if we should worship this God in our time today, then God must also speak in our time. Notice people didn't get on no great super move toward the things of God in the days of the Torah until God appeared and spoke to them. Adam was made, but he didn't seem to get up and just name the animals until somehow he was told to do that. He was commanded, you can tell that he was given certain of these basic commands by the information laid out in the Torah. Abraham, Noah, all these people, Jacob wrestling with angel, like they they basically did all they did because they had some contact or revelation with God, from God, they heard the voice of God. But you don't think today God needs to speak. You hold your teacher responsible as a teacher of the Torah or a teacher of the Christian doctrine and you expect them to study and search out things and to live a good clean moral life and to be always studying and learning right to present spiritual truths to you they themselves as teachers and mores also hold you with some amount of accountability in the things that they have passed on to you in their teachings because they expect you to be studying the things they teach you as well because they want you to learn and grow. So the responsibility is on, it goes both ways. The pendulum swings both ways. They have a responsibility to speak and teach you and you have a responsibility to reflect what you have learned to them. Sometimes they even quiz you and question you and in some cases they might even use you as a new teacher when they're starting up something new, a new church, a daughter church or a new camp or to Sunday school. You have to show that you have learned so you got to teach others now as they grow. But the idea is that the teacher speaks and you must reflect that back. Now God, according to the Torah, is the greatest teacher. He spoke in times past, and people are speaking back now by teaching his Torah, now that the earth has been destroyed, where the presence of the God of the Torah has been destroyed or removed from us because we don't see him acting up anymore, and all you want to do is continue to teach the same old things. You don't think that you should have a refreshing of God. But even the Christians who don't use the Torah heavily, they believe there should be a refreshing because they sing songs like, times of refreshing and talk about give me that old time religion and revival crusades and revival meetings because even the Christians who don't believe in the Torah believe that there should be a revival and a refreshing but the Torah person does not call for God and demand that God act and do something today I'm telling you today God must speak Coming up to about 1948, when Israel was being set up as a modern state or nation, I don't remember the, the person's name. I think he was a rabbi, by the way that my memory is going, but I, I can't remember his name. And the story goes that whatever problems they were facing, you know, in getting themselves set up, and the wars they were having, I guess, with the Palestinians, or whatever the deal was at that particular time, and they were, they were under a big threat of being destroyed, something like that. And this particular rabbi stood up and he, he said, God, if you don't, like I'm putting it in my own words now, if you don't help your people or save your people from this, then we're going to basically be destroyed and then go see who's going to uh, teach your word or speak your word anymore. And the story goes on to say that whatever it was worked out and they got the victory and things went fine and so on, they were able to get set up. But, but they were saying that basically they, they, he, he cornered God. He demanded that God speak or God act rather and God did the thing and they were praising God for that. So why is it 
that if that story is true, that you don't feel today that you need to demand that God act. Church of Israel cried out in their bondage for 400 years in the times of the pharaohs and said, look, we need some deliverance. And he had to speak, it seems, and go get this man, Moses, and give him all kinds of miracles to say, go back and go deliver this people. I'm with you. Tell Pharaoh, let my people go. So they cried out and he said, I've heard the cry of my children of Israel. I'm come down to deliver them. You are in bondage right here in the Americas and over all the earth anyway, from all these different commonwealth nations. And you have been crying out, I've seen even the prayer meetings and the vigils and whatever that goes on, and God never asked to deliver you. But in the pages of the Bible, if you cried out, he would have done so. I just read again this morning from the book of Ezra, how they went down by the river Ahava, and they're fasting and seeking the Lord, and they got delivered again, and were able to return home to rebuild their lives as ancient Israel again from Babylonian captivity. In the book of Judges with Samson and the many other deliverance, deliverances that they had from the different Mesopotamian kings and so on, whenever these children of Israel decided to repent and cry out again, and actually sometimes they didn't even repent, they just cried out. Then they repented later on after they were restored in their land, but then we know they went back to their idolatry. But even when they were unrighteous and not keeping the laws properly, they would cry out and got deliverance. So if you are circumcised and if you don't go to a camp and if you are stuck in prison and if you have done this and done that and whatever and if you don't know how to read the Hebrew and whatever, why is it that your God cannot speak today and deliver you? He did not deliver you from, from Leopold. He did not deliver you from the conquistadors. He did not deliver you long before this American um, slavery from the British and, and the Germans, the Americans and from Hitler. And, and from the French and everybody else who is in it, the British, whoever. And he sure did not deliver you as well from the Arab slave trade. Why does the God of Israel respond as soon as the children of Israel cry out and deliver them if it is on the papers of the, the scriptures? But when you cry out now, he cannot deliver you in the same way. And you pass from captivity to captivity, from bondage to bondage. And you cannot be delivered. And you continue to believe in this God? This is madness. It is only true on the pages of the Torah. If this God is real, this God must speak. He must act once again. He must do something once again. Or we cannot continue to believe in such a God. This God is only real on the paper. And if he wants my faith, he's got to have to do some action and begin to do and act and speak. Like he did supposedly in ancient times on the pages of the Bible that I pay $99 for or $59, whatever it is. I remember I was younger. I bought a Bible because I was really interested in learning. And it wasn't even the best Bible compared to the ones that I've seen today and the ones that I own today. Like I got Hebrew Bibles now and whatever. And all kinds of other fa fancy Bibles with the Greek and whatever. But at the time... It was the Dake and it, uh, the Dake Bible. It was Jamaica I bought that many, 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 many years ago. I was much younger. Three thousand dollars I picked up and bought the Bible for. Never bought any Bible like that. In fact, I never bought Bibles at that time in Jamaica. I was so young. I was just um. You you usually just get your Bible like your parents just give you a Bible or you get a Bible from the church because there were so many extra Bibles at, at at the churches. And um. 3,000 bucks I picked up my money for and, and went and bought the Bible for. And, and it was, I liked the Bible at the time. I still like it, even though I haven't used it for probably close to 10 years now. But, very big Bible as well too. But it seems like he's only speaking when I get a Bible and open it. But he does not speak today. And all the people getting sick and dying around you. But prophets can go and tell somebody, wash in this river and you'll be well. Or they go and pray for somebody, they'll be well. But today, where are those prophets that are healing people? This God has disappeared. Once you close the Bible and leave church or your camp and go home, he has disappeared. 
but you make him reappear when you open the Bible. And he believed those three teaching Hebrew Israelites. He believed the pastors and the rabbis and the imams. This is all a big, this is religion. God must speak. Today, in a way where you know for sure, let another man come down off another mountain so I can see his face glowing, so I can believe. Better yet, let me be invited to go up that mountain and meet with this God. And you also go up and meet with this God. Because that's when we will all believe. See, what Moses should have done was tell every Israelite, hurry up and go up the mountain to see him for yourself. And stop giving me no problem about we're scared. You see, that's the way they pull off the deception. It's to let you know that they were too scared to go up there. So they told Moses, you go up and talk to him. People weren't concerned with proving God when they lived in a time where there were millions and millions and millions of gods in different nations all around them in the earth. And everybody's fighting over which God is a real God. Well, if this one is so real and there's rumblings and so on, why don't you run up the mountain as well? And they tell you, well, if they try to touch the mountain, they would die. Because they just wanted one man to control the whole revelation. But if every house was able to go up that mountain, it would have spread like wildfire throughout the entire earth. Instead of just one man going up and it just stays there, a weak story passing around. Weak because it might have been strong in that nation of Israel right there, but it was too weak to pass out with the strength to the other nations of the earth. How can God descend upon the mountain in a way he has never done in all of the existence of humanity and the entire worth does, world does not flock to Mount Sinai? People should have been running from Persia, from the ancient Americas, from everywhere else all over the earth, from China, everywhere, to go to this mountain to find God. The way they want to go today to go see Gobekli Tepe. The way they want to go today to go see all these different ancient monuments and so on. The temple of Karnak, they want to go visit it and so on. Like in ancient times, people should have been flocking from everywhere. Especially when their kings in their own lands were, were oppressing them and so on. And forcing them to fight wars. With mothers and children at home knowing that father might not come back home from that war. And people find a way to meet the creator at Sinai. And they don't flock there. To go and find and meet with this God. So that they can get some salvation for themselves. Knowing that the creator is bigger than the God of Israel. Because of the, if the creator somehow is giving salvation to Israel. Well we want salvation too. What makes us not. What, what makes us not want the same kind of deliverance that Israel has. Something is really strange about the pages of the Torah. So now Moses comes down with tablets of writing from Mount Sinai. Tablets of writing, I say, to a people who in large part cannot read and write. You know, I still need to look into it some more, but I did a little bit of looking in and I realized that way back then, most Israelites, like the average Israelite, couldn't write and couldn't read and were in large part illiterate in that sense. Now, of course, they had enough sense to go about their daily work and so on and working in the field and growing their crop and so on. But reading and writing for, for many, many years up until recent times was, uh, was just reserved for scribes and well-learned, well-selected people. Even many kings of ancient times could not read. Could not read. That's why they had scribes and people who would read and document the stuff and read it back to them. Even kings could not read. But you're telling me the average Israelite is going to take that two piece of rock or stone and read the commandments from Moses? So most of them couldn't read and write. And God gives his revelation and tablets of stone that need to be read for people to get his revelation. 
You give your revelation. Finally, when you break through to humanity and you break through to one people. And you give your revelation in writing, knowing that most people can't read. I mean, I, I, I don't know about this Bible anymore. I'm serious. I don't know. And all I was doing was just trying to search for God. If you don't know Chinese, are you going to tell somebody to go do a course on this or whatever and tell them to go and learn it in Chinese? They cannot read Chinese. But God, the wisest of all, gives his Torah in writing to people who in large part were illiterate. And then you curse Muhammad saying he was illiterate. So how does his book get started off? But the Israelites, they got their book started off and most of them were illiterate. And you tell me, I got a problem teaching these things. No, because you don't want people to think for themselves. I didn't start this out trying to gravitate to Africa and to Egypt and Kemet. My love and study of the Torah, my investigation, when I said, after all these years of growing up as a Christian and so now Hebrew Israelite understanding, I, I should take some time to get real deep into the Torah. And when I study it, I find a great disappointment that I need to go back and study history because something seems wrong and fishy with the Torah. So now in the Torah, you have people telling you that you must be cleansed and you wash yourself and so on. Things like that, like I see the, the Egyptians doing. And they had all this kind of washing and ceremony and priesthood system that seemed to be reflected in the Torah. So it just seems a little bit odd to me. But anyway, you get people here today telling you based on the Torah and the New Testament that you should be cleansed from your sin and offer up sacrifices to be cleansed and baptized to be cleansed and so on. Things that the Egyptians were doing before there was a nation of Israel set up. Um, because remember Moses wanted to leave Egypt to go and sacrifice and the Pharaoh just said, well, go and sacrifice in the land. And he's like, what well, we can't do that the Egyptians will kill us. Why? Because it's like he, he's duplicating their sacrifices. Why? Because they were already doing it as Egyptians. So where is the uniqueness of this nation of Israel? And where is the unique message that Moses came with from God? Go and deliver the children of Israel and go and do a sacrifice for them the same way that they're doing it. And it's so similar that, that Moses said, if we do it right here, it looks too same, like we're infringing on their religious system, that they'll be mad. The Egyptians will be mad at us. They might kill us. So he says, no, we got to leave the land. You see, because it's the same thing. So he just wants to go and duplicate it outside now in his own territory where they might not be so mad. Although still when they left, they were still in Egyptian territory. So these people are telling you in the Torah to be cleansed and the Day of Atonement to be cleansed from your transgressions and your offenses to the Most High and so on. Um, to be cleansed. And people are teaching you today in this Hebrew Israelite movement and in the Christian churches to be cleansed from your sin. And the same Hebrew Israelite garment, special garment wearing more or teacher is telling you that based on the Torah you need to be cleansed from your sins. Who is telling you these things? Who? Another man who himself also misses the mark and is going to tell you about cleansing for righteousness sake and cleansing from your sins. And he has innumerable, immemorable, like just masses of a lifetime of sins himself and he tells you to be cleansed from your sin and he reads from the pages of the Torah and the New Testament how you should do it now that is strange the sinner telling you to be cleansed from sin and the worst sinner can pick up the Torah and in one year begin to teach you how you should be righteous so all that changes him is just reading the book. And if he is a high class person, a powerful person worldwide, he'll still teach the stuff even though he's not going to release his power in the world. And we know in our world, when people have that much power, where they are internationally known, they're always 
into some backdoor stuff. And so, who baptized you? Who baptized you? Somebody who is pure enough to baptize you? Even though, to their credit, they have had many years of sinning themselves. And will go on sinning even after they baptize you. And people will complain about the things that they do to them because they're sinning. They are unjust sometimes in some of their treatment towards you and toward others. And you hear about it and so on. But they're pure enough to baptize you. Who tells you the way to God? The person who went the wrong way throughout their life? And now that they found the Torah, they know the way. When the scriptures itself teach us that all things are alike to every man. All things are alike. I'll leave that because I'm going to do a lesson on that another time. But consider seriously today what I'm saying to you when I tell you God must speak. Apparently he spoke in the times of Shiva. He spoke in the times of the pharaohs. He spoke in the times when people did their ancient meditations. He spoke in ancient Israel. He spoke at Mount Sinai. He spoke in India under the banyan tree. He speaks on top of the mountain to the Guru. He speaks to Muhammad. He speaks at Calvary to whoever is there. He spoke again on the day of Pentecost. He speaks everywhere people are now. He speaks to you in the Bible. So it seems that God speaks to everyone anywhere but there is only one way so somebody is lying somewhere and I find the greatest lie is the religion itself that tells you that God said to tell you this until God shows up himself and speaks where the whole earth can hear him at the same time. Instead of lighting up with thunders and lightning and so on and rumblings, one mountain. Let all mountains on the earth in all continents in every country be lit up with fire and smoke and rumblings and thunderings so that all the earth can know and hear and see with their eyes and think with their own mind the invisible speaks the creator is alive let him speak to all of us like that because the world today can no longer tolerate one man or one group or one religion saying this is the way and God spoke to them that's why there are so many wars because religion is doing the wars conquering people, telling them they are superior and so on based on a word from God but the other people have no way of verifying that word no way of verifying that word and the people today who are teaching these things cannot verify themselves as well, so there's all kinds of fight, where is the real Mount Sinai you can't even verify the mountain that God showed up on that Moses climbed but you are sure that you can verify the word of God today in the Hebrew text, the Pale Hebrew, that some even say was not the original language. And the scriptures itself also say it's simply the language of the Hebrews. And you see the deception right there? Don't even want to tell you what language it was because it will reveal too much. So it is just the language of the Hebrews. Everybody else can talk about their language but the language of the Hebrews and you don't see that this is a big trick the only time things will get clarified is when we hear for ourselves the word of God from God himself because I'm telling you 
today in our world, God needs to speak.